Hello and welcome. This is Matthew. And today I have the pleasure of working with Moshix from the Moshix mainframe channel on a series of videos, starting with this one, which will look at automating the installation of Ubuntu in the Hercules emulator. So we will be able to run Linux for big iron on our very own emulated mainframes with Hercules. Most of you will be familiar with Moshix. I mentioned him in a number of the videos on this channel, and I've also worked with him on some projects. Uh, he provides some of the ideas for my Proxy 3270 application, and obviously is very active in the community. So it was a lot of fun to work with him. Uh, thank you, Moshix, for suggesting that we work on this project together. And this is going to be a series of three videos. Uh, this first one will be just our preliminary look at getting things set up to start a manual normal installation of Ubuntu inside of Hercules. Then we'll start looking at can we pull out some of the values that were used during the installer to uh, drive the installer with a pre-seed file. So pre-seeding is the Debian and Ubuntu method for automating the installation. And at the end of this video, we'll get to the point where we think we're ready to start our uh, hypothetically fully automated installer for the first time. The next video is going to look at just refining that pre-seed file, refining that process, uh, answering more questions when they get prompted during the installation for things that we didn't uh, get in the pre-seed file initially. And then the third video is going to be fast forwarding in time a bit after we did some work and more collaboration offline, uh, where we will show you the complete fully automated turnkey set of scripts and pre-seed files and everything you need to install your own Ubuntu in Hercules uh, by just running an install command. And then it's totally hands off from there and you'll have a fully installed system. Uh, so this is kind of an interesting way we're approaching this video. Both Moshix and I will post these videos on our respective channels, and you can find all the relevant links in the description below. Uh, we used a shared terminal window with Tmux. We were SSH'd into the same system and were able to see what we were doing in a shared Tmux session. But otherwise, we recorded these videos each independently on our own side, and we are also editing them independently on our own side and we'll be posting our own versions of the videos up to our channels. Uh, so if you want to see everything that we're doing from Moshe's screen, uh, you'll be able to go watch that on his channel. And of course, here you're going to see everything as I saw it on my screen as we were working on this. So that can be fun. Let us know uh, what you think. And I look forward to seeing if Moshe's edited these things a, a little bit different than I did and uh, listen to his uh, his channel music on his videos. I know I just have a boring, silent background. So I hope this is fun for everyone. I know I had fun. Uh, it's always great working with Moshix. And without further ado, let's just dive into the videos because uh, they are kind of long, right? This was a process to figure all of this out. So thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoy. And uh, let's jump right into it. Hello, Matthew. Hi there, Moshix. How's it going for you? Uh, very well, thanks. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So um, we're trying today for the first time a a new uh, format for our both for both our channels, and uh, I can I can give a little bit of uh, of a uh, taste what what we're trying to do from my point of view, and then maybe uh, you could say something from your point of view. So we're we're going to do obviously something. Uh, mainframe related today and we're going to do it the two of us together and uh, working on the same computer working on the same machine uh, doing something together and what we're doing today is uh, automating a mainframe uh, ubuntu installation on top of hercules and we're going to do it together and see how how this goes and we've never done it together and uh and see how how it comes out and if people like it and so i'm very excited to be doing this with you i've i'm a huge fan of your videos i've i think i've watched all of your videos both mainframe and os 400 and uh, open vms related so um, i couldn't think of a better person to do this with Great. Well, thanks. It's great to be here with you Moshix. and uh, for those of you watching on my channel here, I'm 
probably referenced Moshix in the majority of my videos in one way or another, particularly the mainframe ones. Uh, so uh, you're probably well familiar with uh, with Moshix and his work. And yeah, it's great to be here. And I'm curious to see if we're able to get this uh, Z Linux installation all fully automated. Well, perfect. So let's get started then. Are you logged in? I guess you are. I am, yeah. So if you want to start uh, maybe the TMUX on your side, I'll join it. And uh, that'll give us a shared uh, sort of terminal session here. We can see what we're doing together. Okay. So um, let me do that. I'm making my font as big as possible. It has been, unfortunately, and I have to apologize for that, a common um complaint that my font is uh, is too small in my videos and even though i've been saying in my videos that it's really meant to be seen on a larger screen not on a phone obviously you know <laughs> most people watch these videos uh, at some point on a phone including myself <laughs> so, <laughs> so i'm making this font today as big as possible yeah, uh, yeah but, i know these are these are difficult to do on a little uh, phone sized screen Okay, I have started the team up session. Okay, I'll attach to that. So uh, our, our mission here today on this video, we'll see how far we get, um, given that uh, an installation of Ubuntu uh, takes quite a long time on, a, on an emulated mainframe on Hercules. Our mission is to uh, take what we have here in this directory. We have Ubuntu and ISO image. And what we would like to do have create at the end of the day a fully automated installation of Ubuntu from an ISO image so that in the end um, the user would go through the motions and have a fully installed server uh, image, um, emulated disk image that, that then starts uh, under Hercules and then they can log in and they know this is their own particular uh, uh, Z Linux image that they can work with. And the background for this is that I had released just a couple of days ago a video where I had made available a fully automated um, uh, Linux image called TKBuntu, which starts with an image that I have provided. And of course, there is a huge security risk for that. Um, people shouldn't just run a network connected uh, operating system image of any kind, not just uh, Z Linux or Linux or Windows. And so the idea came that uh, we should instead start from, from an ISO image and fully automate it so that the end effect is the same, but it's way more secure. Yeah, I think that's a great idea and really important as well. Um, you know, just downloading pre-installed disk images and you know, running them on your local computer with access to your local network. Uh, it's certainly good for people to to think twice about that and think, wait, why are we doing it this way? So uh, this mm -hmm. sort of uh, auditable, being able to pull from a trusted source and, and do the automated install, uh, I think is a, a great idea and hopefully something that, uh, you know, can be leveraged to maybe adapt to other Linux distros. Um, you know, Debian and Ubuntu, certainly their pre-seed automation is is very similar. Uh, and then we'll, we'll see what else the community can come up with once a automated Linux installs available. Okay. So well, you just said it, it, it takes um, a concept on Ubuntu and Debian uh, uh, denominated machines uh, called pre-seed. So basically you pre-seed the installer with all the answers that it needs to, uh, to go through uh, the installation uh, configuration, right? Yep, and this is how I install really all of my Linux VMs uh, just on my home VMware servers in my lab here. It's really convenient because I can just make a new ISO image of the Debian uh, or the Ubuntu version that I'm interested in. And when I make a new VM, I point the virtual CD-ROM drive to that image uh, and I just fire it up. And a couple of minutes later, I'm left with a brand new VM all up to date. Uh, with my preferred exact configuration. So uh, I do have experience doing this with uh, x86. Uh, there will, of course, be a few differences for the S390X mainframe distribution of Linux. So I'll be curious to see how we're able to automate some of those early setup questions. Yes. Um, 
but otherwise it, it looks like it it works pretty much the same way and it might even be a little bit easier because we don't need to remaster and remake a new iso image to boot from um, yes. since the way the mainframe ipls is uh quite a bit different than how our regular uh, x86 boxes ipl okay sounds like uh, a fun project uh, let's see how far we can get in this session we don't necessarily have to do it all uh, in today's session but uh I think we're going to get uh, quite a bit uh, done today. Indeed. Over yeah, I think we're going to have a bit of a learning phase here uh, to begin with. And then once we uh, are able to uh, sort of get through some of the automation steps, we'll be in a better position, I think, to figure out, OK, right, how do we do the fully start to finish uh, kind of one click automation? Yeah, as always in our videos, we go uh, we make these videos and make all the mistakes so that the the viewer doesn't have to go through the, those mistakes again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Over to you. You you have controls with the keyboard. All right. I have control. So yeah, let's just dive right in. Um, I'm familiar with the setup that you had started working on for TK Ubuntu. Uh, so it looks like we do have our baseline here, which is a Hercules configuration file that should get us going. Uh, so that looks good. And we'll be set up for a disk image. Uh, we probably won't need the tape, but no harm having that there. And then the network magic is key. So that's good that this is already set up for us. Yeah, I think we can remove the terminals, actually. Um, they OK, yeah. More of a nuisance than anything, because they can be accessed anyway. And then the. Uh, IP tables automation. So uh, the way this works for people who aren't familiar with uh, one of the approaches that you can take for Hercules networking. Uh, let yeah. me look at the Hercules configuration file again. Uh, so this is using a CTCI device. That's channel to channel. Uh, do you know what the I stands for? Interface, probably. Uh, channel to channel interface. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the way this looks from the Linux perspective is that it creates a, a new network interface on your Linux system that connects one side to this emulated channel to channel interface in the mainframe. And then the other side is a network interface on the Linux box. Uh, and it's just these two devices essentially in their own private little network. So the mainframe side will have the IP address 10.1.1.2, uh, even though, of course, inside uh, a, a uh, MVS 3.8 mainframe, there's no concept of IP. This just shows up as a device. But since we're doing Linux, which is a much newer operating system, uh, it will be able to treat this channel-to-channel -channel device that's just plugged in to the host Linux box um, as an actual Ethernet interface that it will be able to assign an IP address to and send packets back and forth. So it's a private network between these two IP addresses, um, the host and Hercules. And then the network setup here sets up the network address translation, the NAT uh, forwarding rules. So by using the Linux box as our router, anything inside of Hercules can talk to this router and it will get NATed out to the internet. That's the theory anyway. Yeah, and the rest of the script is just uh, for uh, cosmetics and logging, et cetera. But I think the part here where it says IP tables, that could be done manually. And I, and that's exactly what I did for years. Um, and and then we just put it into the script. But uh, you know, many people will probably just be doing this manually. And a lot of the other script uh, uh, lines is just to find out which interface the underlying Linux, uh, which from now on we should just call the host Linux, the host, uh, yeah. is doing to get to the internet so that we we, uh, we don't automatically get this uh, dollar interface um, as, a, as a variable. But uh, it, it, exactly as you said, uh, that's really all it is. It's just a network address translation configuration. Yep, so that's nice uh, and convenient to have it automated. All right, so maybe let's make a folder um, for our first attempt. I'll call it try one. And we'll just copy in 
uh, everything from that template directory and start customizing it. Uh, so as you suggested, I'm actually going to get rid of the tape drive as well, if you don't think yes. we'll need that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we'll rename that. We don't need any display terminals. Uh, because no, once the... Hercules, when there is no display uh, terminal uh, configuration in the Hercules configuration file, it will automatically take 3270 as a default port. So um, it still uses one, even if it's not there. But it's better to remove it. Okay. And then our DASD here, let's create... Um, uh, I know TK Ubuntu used the the CCKD or emulated a, a CKD device like a 3390. And some of the folks in the mainframe enthusiast Discord channel were asking about using the FBA device. Uh, I think it's fixed block addressing. Um, yes. Because it sounds like that's probably a faster disk emulation. Uh, I don't know if particularly for Linux or just overall in Hercules. So I think we can probably give that a try. Yeah, it is. Yeah, FBA is essentially an iSCSI device, uh, sorry, a SCSI device. And it is it is quite a bit faster uh, for Hercules to emulate than the CKD. All right. So it looks like our FBA devices uh, may as well just go with the newest uh, type of device here, 9336. Yep. And uh, how big do we want our uh, root volume to be here? I think, you know, I'm thinking maybe four gigabytes um, is really all that's needed for Linux install five. I've installed it on as little as two gigabytes. All right. Yeah, we'll give ourselves a little breathing room then with uh, maybe yeah. four gigabytes. So we're going to need to give it 512 byte sectors so we can do the math here. Oh, do we not have uh, the desktop calculator? We'll uh, <laughs> install that. Um, oh, do you want to go ahead and type password. in the password? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Now, the host Linux here is just an Ubuntu itself. I think it is actually Ubuntu 18.04. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, in the end, anything that can run Hercules, and we're using a recent build of the SDL Hyperion Hercules here, um, should be able to do this same yeah. thing. Uh, so we want four gigabytes, which is four times that many 1024s. <laughs> that looks about right. And then we need 512 yes. byte sectors. So that is going to be that many sectors. Yep. So we can do DASD init 64. Uh, this is going to be, do you want to use compressed or just uncompressed? Uncompressed, I think it's a bit faster. Okay. Uh, and we can do LFS to make it one file. And this is going to be a 9336 FBA device. I'll just call it uh, maybe HD0. Yep. And it will be 8388608. Uh, what am I missing here? Do I need to see HD0? Does the volume label go last? I've already forgotten. Something um, like that. Yeah, I think the volume label goes last. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, that's, or does the, the file name goes first? There we go, hd0.fba. Oh. Uh, vol serial number goes first, and then size goes last. We'll oh, get there eventually. Okay. okay, perfect. So one, while it's doing this, um, actually the latest Hyperion images from Fish on the GitHub They've changed again the syntax inside the the Hercules configuration file, and uh, and uh, we'll see if it, it just happened very recently. We'll see when we start this Hercules if it's complaining about it or not. I I wonder, but uh, but they've changed the uh, the uh, Z arch configuration um, uh, quite a bit. So we see here arch. Oh, the arch mode, level. yeah. Yeah, uh, this should become now facility um, bit, but uh, let's see if it still accepts it right now, even in old style. But let's see what comes out. All right. Uh, so we've changed the device type to that 9336 FBA, and then our file yep. uh, device 120 is fine. So 
that should do it for our Hercules configuration. And we're giving four gigabytes of memory and four CPUs, which is plain enough. Um, it doesn't actually accelerate that much if you give it four CPUs or eight or 16, even for people who have uh, giant uh, personal computers, because at some point uh, it's it's one of those uh, diminishing returns uh, uh, situations for, for Hercules. Yeah, I think between the emulation yeah. overhead uh, and then, of course, something like installing Linux is just a single threaded process anyway. Exactly. So yeah. um, that's good. All right, so the last thing we need to do in order to uh, install from an Ubuntu ISO is actually copy the contents of the ISO uh, out so that we'll be able to modify them. And uh, also, you don't point Hercules at an ISO image. You point it at some files inside the ISO image. So we'll go ahead and mount that. Uh, loop read only. And we can just throw it on slash mount. So if we look at that, that is the contents of our uh, install image. So let's put that somewhere convenient. Uh, we'll make a directory called maybe Ubuntu 18.04 install. Yeah. And then we just want a uh, sort of exact copy of our CD content there. So I'll put that into our Ubuntu folder with rsync. And okay. if we verify that the files were expect them, yep. So we're done with the image. We can unmount that. And of course, we already see the pre-seed directory here. Um, so it is it is one of the facilities of any Ubuntu or Debian to be able to pre-seed the installer. So. Yeah, so it looks like it's giving you some examples for either minimal or a regular install. So that uh, could help us out as a starting point. Uh, but we'll take a look at that in uh, sort of our next phase here. Uh, the other interesting thing about the the mainframe IPL process here, when we're we're booting from what were essentially an emulated CD-ROM drive or DVD drive, uh, is that what you IPL from is this .ins file. And as far as I can tell, what this does is it tells the mainframe to put the contents of these files on the CD or out of this directory at these locations in memory. Yes. Exactly. Uh, and then I think it just starts up from, right, it's the normal IPL address as if these were cards, starting with the first card at address zero here, and then it does all of its IPL work. Exactly. So we have two facilities that might help us with preceding later, which is the PARM file. Uh, and when you boot Linux on an x86 machine, whether you're using Grub or direct UFI booting, um, you're able to pass parameters to the kernel on the kernel command line using your bootloader. Uh, well, there is not really the equivalent of a bootloader on the mainframe, but this parm file contains what will eventually be passed to the kernel as the kernel command line arguments. Uh, so the Linux kernel for uh, the mainframe just knows to look at apparently this particular address for those parameters. Uh, yeah. And then of course the init RD, which I suspect is where we will end up um, needing to put our pre-seed file. But that's interesting because we might then need to tell it what the size of that init RD is. I've, I've never actually modified an init RD on the mainframe. So we'll see what that process looks like. <laughs> Yeah, the interesting thing about the mainframe, as you correctly said, there is no bootloader because the mainframe from its uh, the IBM mainframe from the get go in the in the mid sixties was designed so that you could even boot it from a one sing, single um, punch card, which of course contains 80, 80 bytes, and so anything that fits within eighty initial bytes, uh, where if you can put any any meaningful program in eighty bytes. Um, then you could actually boot from anything, from tape, from punch cards, from anything that can contain 80 bytes that the mainframe can read in. If you could make a printer also have a buffer with 80 bytes that the mainframe could read in, you could even <laughs> IPL from a printer on the mainframe. That's a, one of the beauties of it. All right, let's see. Okay, so I think in a, I don't think we got all of our network interfaces. Yeah. Yeah, we need to set up network interface and maybe we could also do some logging for later. 
Okay. Um, so for the network interface, if you make the, let's see, actually, where is our Herc IFC? Uh, so if you set the sticky bit uh, yes. or the set UID bit on the uh, little Hercules utility program called Herc IFC, so that will allow that. it to run as root. Um, so you don't need to run all of Hercules as root. It will actually just call this interface setup program to do the stuff it needs to do to create the uh, the tap the ton tap network interfaces. Uh, also, while we're here, we can run that set network script. Yeah, it wants the logs directory, but um, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, but it looks like it did what it needed to do. So we should have network access from inside of Hercules uh, through those IP tables rules. Let's see. Let's do. Uh, uh, an IPA for the uh, ton zero interface to make sure it's uh, there. Ton zero. Probably not until Hercules starts. Let's try that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that worked that time. Oh, and uh, you suggested, so if we do Hercules, if we log everything um, to a file, you just t that uh, yeah. to a try a one dot log. Okay, we're not going to get the nice graphical Hercules uh, capabilities here because it's going to a file now instead of our yes highly capable console. But that's okay. Uh, so let's make a new session here. Snapify so IPA ton zero. Let's just do a. Oh, yeah, that works. Okay, ah, here perfect. it is. Okay. Yeah, so it did uh, indeed start up a tunnel. Yeah. So the yeah. difference between ton zero and ton, uh, tap and ton, of course, uh, ton zero is level three and tap is going to be level two. Um, so this, of course, correctly started this as a tunnel. So that's. that's uh, that's 10.1.1.1. And of course, this is the host operating system we're on. And then uh, Linux, once it starts inside Hercules, will have the address dot two here at the end, 10.1.1.2. Excellent. Okay, so in Hercules here, uh, before we try any fancy automation or anything, we'll just make sure that we can IPL the installer uh, and establish network connectivity and we do that by saying IPL, and it was Ubuntu 18.04 install or installer. <laughs> I think install, and then install, yes. Ubuntu.ins. And that should start the process of loading that uh, install kernel. I'm thinking that maybe it's easier to just have the normal Hercules panel. So we have <laughs> that's what I'm thinking as well. Here. Yeah, <laughs> let me uh, let's just quit this and, and try that again. Um, all right, so yeah, let's just do normal Hercules here. And then we'll try that again. Ubuntu dot INS. Okay, so we see. Okay, now we can actually see it working here with the MIPS number and the instruction counter. Yeah. And what it's doing here is uh, reading in that Ubuntu kernel into memory. So you can see here 64 MIPS in the lower right corner here. Okay. Okay, so now you might recognize these are the actual Linux kernel boot messages. All right, and uh, here we are. So why don't you configure our network device? So uh, Linux for the mainframe, uh, or at least the Debian-based distributions, require installing uh, over the network. So the first thing it wants to do is set up the network. So we have our CTC device, and we will tell it the first device address is the read device, and the second device address is the write device. Which is what we have in the Hercules configuration file. If you remember, we have two devices, channel-to-channel uh, -channel devices, effectively one for reading or obtaining traffic, the one for sending traffic, and that's exactly what we're giving it. Yeah, uh, and I'm not sure how these 
protocol selections affect the interface, but since we're using Linux, I'm going to try the Linux option here. All right, we don't want to use DHCP uh, because we have to hard code the addresses of both sides of the tunnel in Hercules. We'll just go ahead and set static IP addresses here in Linux. So that's going to be 10.1.1.2 uh, for our Linux, our mainframe Linux side of things. That's, uh, we'll just do a slash 24 there. And then 10.1.1.1 1 .1 is the host Linux, which will be our gateway, our network router. Exactly. So Zilinux thinks that the tunnel interface we just saw on the host Linux is a router, but in, of course, as we know, it's just uh, a tunneling device. Yeah. Uh, and you'll notice that I'm typing a period, a dot before every input. Uh, that's because remember, we are still on the Hercules console here. Uh, so if I just type a command at this Hercules prompt, Hercules would think I'm trying to run a Hercules command, like attach a new device or IPL the system. Uh, but by typing a dot, that's the default character for Hercules to pass whatever I enter through to the operating systems uh, console, which in this case is our, our Linux guests console. Uh, so we're just using the Cloudflare 1.1.1.1 DNS server. And there's actually some thinking into that. Um, the Google DNS 8.8.8 .8 does not accept uh, large format DNS queries, which for instance, ZOS or ZVM uh, send out, uh, whereas, whereas the Cloudflare DNS server 1.1.1 .1 does accept those. So um, some folks have, you know, have tried to configure um, ZOS or ZVM to use uh, the, D the Google DNS, they they think DNS doesn't work, but it's just because Google doesn't handle all the uh, RFC formats. Uh, that's interesting. Um, uh, when we're waiting for the installer to, to do something, we have a second where we just need to sit and wait. I have a, another large DNS uh, story. <laughs> uh, so uh, basically what this installer is saying now is we're not actually going to do the installation from the the console device here uh, it configured the network such that from any other system we then ssh into this system and then we'll get the normal uh, sort of uh, graphical text user interface uh debian and ubuntu installer so it's saying since you're going to ssh in you need to set a temporary password just for the session so i'll just use the password test And now it's telling me that I should be able to SSH into the system. So remember this 10.1.1.2 IP address is the IP address of our Z Linux guest uh, operating system running here in Hercules. So we'll switch over to the next uh, TMX session down here. And we should be able to SSH into installer at 10.1.1.2. Okay, that's a good sign. We'll accept that host fingerprint. Uh, that password we set up as test. All and right. Here we are. We're in the installer. Uh, so I think since we're just experimenting with this, the first thing we can do is just make sure the network works. Um, uh, obviously, it's working to some degree locally, but can we get out to the internet at large? So we'll just go into a shell here and start pinging things. Yeah, that's working. So from inside our Linux running inside of Hercules, we're able to get out to the internet through those IP tables, network address translation rules that that set network script set up. Uh, we can also try pinging things by name to make sure that name resolution works. Yeah, yep. perfect. That looks good. So if I exit out of this and then reconnect, we'll be back at that initial installer prompt. And so some people have been asking me, um, why can I not um, connect with the uh, host Linux and, uh, you know, or other machines on my home network from within Z Linux? And uh, obviously, it doesn't know anything about your, uh, let's say, one dot, you know, 192.168.0. One, uh, dot something network because all it can see is the tunneling device 10.1.1.1 .1 .1 .1, and from there straight to the internet it doesn't it's not able 
to access any of the other devices. You would have to set some other special networking tricks to do that. Yeah, and so that's what I end up typically doing in some other uh, uh, operating systems that run inside of emulators. Uh, like I got the the IBM Z Develop and Test uh, Personal Edition from IBM, which uses their mainframe emulator. It's very similar network setup to uh, what you would see in Hercules here. And one of the options is just one of these private tunnel devices between the host Linux and whatever's running inside of the emulator. And I actually set up on my router at home uh, the routing table to know that those uh, the IP address of the emulated system inside of the mainframe emulator can be routed to through my host Linux. And so it's actually uh, routing it as if it was going through another network router to get back to that IP address. And that's one of the ways that uh, if you want to set it up that way, uh, you're able to expose that to other systems on your network. But it, it does require changing the route tables on either your machines that you're trying to access it with or network wide, if you're able to set that up in your, uh, in your network router. Yeah. And, and one more uh, way to do that, maybe we could explore this in a future video together. If, if, uh, people end up, uh, approving of this format is to use the, a bridge, uh, device, um, a virtual bridge device on Linux on the host Linux. Uh, which makes a few things much easier when it comes to uh, level three uh, networking. Um, but we can explore this in the future. Definitely. And yeah, that's how I do all of my SimH networking. So for my VMS uh, on the SimH Vax simulator, uh, mm -hmm. it is able to just attach the network interface to a TAP device. And if I put that in a bridge, it's just sitting there on my network as a real uh, really is a real layer two device. So if you then give it an IP address that's in your local network's IP space, uh, yeah. everything else on your network has has direct access to it. So that's a great way to set these up as well. I was playing with trying to do something like that with Hercules um, using, I think they're the LCS network devices. And yeah. it uh, back at least in the, the Hercules uh, 3.x, days i don't think that was really fully implemented and the last time i tried it in the uh, hyperion days I, I found it to be pretty buggy but i haven't tried it with the sdl hyperion um so it has been quite a while i, I suspect it's uh, a bit more stable and and more fully implemented now so that'd be yeah great. now it's called a q um, oh qe uh, yeah 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 it's a qeth or q ethernet yep. device and for level three it's fully functional but level two is uh, lacking almost all of the functions. And so it can be a mixed bag experience. Uh, if people know exactly what they're doing, I think it works, but, um, but uh, it, it's, it's still a work in progress when it comes to full ethernet emulation. Okay. Yeah. You, you can understand how complex a topic that is. <laughs> oh yeah. It's a, uh, it, it's a whole video series unto itself. Yeah. So this seems to be running. Yeah, so this is working. Um, so it's retrieving all of this over the network. So our network connectivity is working. Uh, in fact, if we go back and look at Hercules, uh, we're up to, looks like it was exceeding 75 MIPS there. So it is doing a lot of work. Uh, and I believe this yellow highlight here means that Hercules is currently um, using that device. So the guest operating system is currently using that device. And you can see the numbers here occasionally increasing. So uh, sure enough, it's it's working. It's sitting here, it's reading all this data over the network, and it will continue with the installation. So I I think, uh, Moshix, you already have basically just a basic installed uh, DASD image after this whole process is done. Yes, so I have one fully installed from this very same uh, ISO image, uh, Ubuntu server installed, done. Obviously, um, just for for the purpose of being complete here, it doesn't make much sense um, to have an, a, a Linux with desktop capability <laughs> installed yes, on the yes. server because there is no video card rendering anything. So um, obviously, it's all just server. But yeah, I have an image of already installed. And, and I think you're asking because 
after the installation uh, of an Ubuntu um, server or any Ubuntu image, there's going to be a file written somewhere, and uh, I don't remember where, with all the choices you gave it during the during the installation process. So you could take that and make that feed that into the next installer, right? Uh, essentially, yes. And so, um, you know, you can find a lot of examples of pre-seed files. Uh, we saw, you know, Ubuntu gives you some on the installation CD, but of course, if you look online in the documentation, there are a lot of examples, but none of the examples were particularly tailored for the mainframe yeah. uh, version of the installer. And for the most part, it will all be the same. Uh, in fact, everything sort of from this point forward will be the same as any other Ubuntu installation. But those initial questions that were asked back here um, through the Hercules console, uh, you know, particularly like what's the write device for the CTC interface and what's the read device for the CTC interface, uh, that of course is is very mainframe specific for these channel to channel interfaces and. I've never seen a sample pre-seed file that uh, has that at all. So my hope is that that was captured as part of the installation log and we'll be able to take a look on an installed Ubuntu copy uh, for the mainframe and see if there's anything in that installation log that the pre-seed or the, the debconf, the Debian configuration system is what this is all based on. Um, that looks like it was the answers to those questions. And then so if we add those into a pre-seed file that should otherwise work on any platform uh, when you're installing Ubuntu, uh, I'm hoping that it answers some of these initial questions for us automatically as well. I'm really curious to find out if it captures those. Because and me too. It's in a funny state at that moment. It's not a real operating system quite yet. It's just a kernel. But um, let, let's see if it captures those. Yeah, usually. and I think it'll depend on if this process is done through the Debian installation system or if this is actually something special that's running ahead of time for the mainframe. Um, exactly. Now, if it's not pre-seedable, if it's not part of the regular installation program, uh, we do have a fallback, right? Hercules has an automation capability and it could read and wait for certain prompts and reply using Hercules functionality at this stage. Uh, so that that could be our other option if we're not able to make this automated 100% with the typical uh, Ubuntu pre-seed mechanism. Yep, we'll find out. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop this. And if you are interested in what a full manual Linux installation on the mainframe looks like, um, I believe you have a video on just that uh, on the Moshix mainframe channel. Yes, and I will uh, link to it in the description below this video you're watching right now to that video that just goes th through exactly what we're doing right now, uh, exactly the same thing. It's it can be, it depends on how fast a machine is. This could actually take two hours. So it's uh, it's not a, a very fast process because every instruction needs to be emulated by Hercules. Um, I just uh, finished a recompiling GCC on Linux on inside Hercules. And uh, because we have this instruction counter, we just saw now a few seconds ago, I saw that it takes 35 trillion instructions for <laughs> uh, for a compilation of gcc and uh, and i quickly calculated that and th 35 trillion instruction if you were executing one instruction every second which you know is human comprehensible time horizons it would equate to about one million years so oh, wow yeah it's quite substantial the amount of work that Hercules has to do here. And the fact that it's doing it reliably and it finishes it is kind of a testament to how well engineered uh, uh, Hercules really is. It is impressive. Uh, I mean, it's all it's just mind boggling to think about how many instructions every modern computer is executing, <laughs> right? Just the amount yeah. of work they're able to do so quickly uh, yeah. is, is really, really amazing. Um, all right, so is this uh, 
is this TK Ubuntu that we want to use to have that installed image? Uh, yes, this okay. should, yeah. if you execute that with sudo, uh, it should just automatically launch it. All right. Uh, go ahead oh, and yeah. enter that again. I forgot to, <laughs> sorry about that. No worries. So this tells us that it gives us five cores and four gigabytes of memory. And as you can see, this is the fully automated uh, image that I was re talking about that I had actually made a video about last week. And so it just, it just does everything automatically. And this is, of course, a already installed image of Ubuntu. This is yeah. has already been installed. We're, this is not the installer. It's not going to run the installer at all. Right. And again, our goal is to look at an installed image and see if uh, we see anything interesting in its installation log that will tell us what the pre-seed parameters are for those those very first steps. So and we'll just yes. wait a minute for that to come up. Uh, so you were talking about DNS. Uh, it's kind of funny. For a while, uh, actually, most of my career, I worked in uh, companies that made healthcare IT software. Okay. And one of the sort of emerging trends in healthcare was uh, secure encrypted messaging right between healthcare providers, healthcare mm -hmm. organizations, all of those things. Of uh, and a, a standard that came out uh, that was... Uh, sort of sponsored by the U.S. federal government in collaboration with some of the big healthcare standards organizations uh, was called Direct, and it, it was built on S MIME, so email with X509 certificates. Yes, and the big problem, of course, with S MIME and X509 in general is, well, how do I get a certificate that I know I can trust for? The recipient, and they decided to use the DNS system for that. Um, so there is a little used DNS record type called CERT, C E R T. Yes. That you can shove an entire X509 certificate, certificate chain in, all that kind of stuff. But of course, that well exceeds the uh, you know single UDP packet that you would be able to send in a typical DNS query. Uh, <laughs> so on top of most DNS providers don't support the cert record type, um, you'd either have to be running your own you know bind server or using one of the few providers that did. Uh, you also had to have your entire DNS chain between the client and you know whatever the target organization is that is serving up these cert records if you're looking up somebody's uh, you know domain. Uh, it had to support TCP DNS queries uh, you know and the automatic fallback to TCP queries when you get the flag that it's too big. So it's all in the DNS specs like any uh, yep. any compliant DNS implementation will work with it. But like you said, right, a lot of them, uh, either for abuse prevention or, you know, denial of service attack, expensive query, you know, prevention, um, they just turn it off, figuring that nobody's actually using this stuff. But, uh, you know, you have to assume that software on the internet expects the RFCs to be implemented correctly if you want to be a, a compliant uh, implementation. But for mainframe, Cloudflare's 1.1.1.1 is the best address to It works to. well. That's good to know. Uh, all right. So, so we should be able to log in now. Is that all up and running? All right. Let's go over to one again. And I'll take control here. Okay, go ahead and yeah, connect us up to the I know. system. <laughs> you know the password you set. Yep. Yes. <laughs> so we're now SSHing into the Zilinux image that's running uh, on the, uh, that's running here. So and it will complain now. Yeah. Ah, so, yes. Uh, uh, because we already we just connected to the previous installing the Linux, um, we need to remove this uh, this entry uh, because it's already in, in in my it was already in my uh, known host file in my SSH configuration. Right. So we'll go in again. There we go. Alrighty, and uh, the sudo is tkbuntu as well. The password. Okay. Uh, so the file we're looking for is logged in the installer's log directory, and we're hoping to see... Oh, so it's actually a directory, the cdub conf directory. Interesting. So I'm not sure if these are... Uh, ah, they're private, and it's just tk 
Boon two. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. So yeah, I think for every package, yes. all sorts of stuff here. Yep. Uh, so there's a utility called, uh, let's see here. I think it's debconf get selections. Yeah. It may not it's be been years since I've... installed. Uh, so yeah, I've, uh, I've looked in the, it's Appendix B in the Debian installation manual. Um, okay. It's in, oh, I see. So we might need to install it. It's in the deb conf utils package. And already we can see, um, uh, you know, uh, obviously running the Linux on Hercules is not going to be a blazing fast performance, even on a very fast AMD Ryzen machine or anything like that. It's just every instruction that Hercules needs to execute for the mainframe architecture results in anything between 50 and 100 uh, Intel instructions on the processor, on the underlying Intel processor or AMD processor to execute. So it's going to be a factor 50 to 100 times slower, at least. Yeah, and it's it's pure software emulation or simulation of the mainframe, right? It's not like running an x86 VM on an x86 box using the hardware VM assists or anything like that. So I, I, I mean, again, it's, it's pretty amazing that you can even get anything done at all. Um, yeah. you know, it, yeah. it seems like it should be a lot slower than it even actually is. So, uh, yeah. impressive, impressive tools we have here today. Um, so let's say, let's just call this precede dot, uh, installer. Let's see what we get in this file. So yeah, I mean, sometimes um, the the notions of emulation and virtualization get confused. Virtualization mm -hmm. is using the underlying uh, processor and basically runs almost at full processor speed when you have virtualization, such as with uh, KVM or Zen or ESX, whereas uh, what we're doing here is emulation. So uh, the underlying processor does not understand mainframe instructions, and those need to be emulated in hardware. In software, sorry. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, this isn't something I expected to take a long time, but <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, it is thinking. So it must be doing yeah. quite a bit of parsing of that. Yeah. Um, of that installer log. And I wonder what uh, what it says at the very beginning. We'll find that very soon if it is already seeing those. Answers <laughs> yeah, I'm not them. sure if they'll end up being in order or if uh if it's alphabetical or, or what but yeah I'm, I'm curious to see what this file looks like so that conf uh, get selections yeah and it sounds already from the name like it's just uh taking the the package selections for the uh, installation in, in installation uh, configuration so i don't expect it to know anything about the console input at the beginning yeah unless that's part of the installer yeah we'll see and speaking about dns you were just talking about it uh at the very beginning the when dns was created or bind was created it was meant to be a distributed database architecture so bind or the dns server side can do a lot more than just uh, serving um ip addresses it, mm -hmm. it's really quite an amazing architecture and it has been extended also recently yeah no new new record types do sort of pop up from time to time through new rfcs and uh there we go um a lot of you know dns sec is also a a public private key um, sort of based encryption key distribution system uh, that uses some of its own record types that's probably one of the newer uh, yeah. most widely used extensions. All right. What does this look like? Okay. So I do recognize this format as the, the precede, uh, yeah. sort of format. How many lines do we have here? Oh, okay. Only 1200, almost 1300 lines. But uh, I saw an error at the very end there. Did you see it? Failed to process the pre-configuration file. 
Uh, well, so yeah. DI, that's yeah. an actual directive. Um, oh, okay. So basically yeah. what the documentation said about this tool is that it, don't use this pre-seed file it generates because it spits out basically every internal parameter of every package. Um, yeah. Many of which, you know, shouldn't be part of pre-seed. So I don't think there's a specific, uh, uh, I guess, Z fiber channel driver. Um, yeah. So. You could search for CTC and see if there's anything. Yeah. Uh, let's look for CTC. Yeah. Okay, so do you accept this configuration? True, that's good. Aha, there choose right. So there it is. CTC write device. And there's probably a CTC read device somewhere. Uh, ah, choices. Okay, so this is where we selected network yep. type. Okay, yeah, so all of those preliminary questions, that is the Debian installer running. Um, to set up then the remote access to it. So that's that's promising. So let's keep now, it. Now, um, there's also an interesting part to this pre-seed is, which is how the password is being handled because they obviously need to provide the user and the password. And that is, um, there's some security around that, right? There's, there's an encryption for the password. Yeah, so there's two ways you can do it. Um, it accepts as if you were inputting your password in plain text in the installer boxes that ask you what do you want your root password to be, um, and you you know there are precede items for password and then password confirm because it it makes you type it twice. Yes. Um, the other option is you can give it the pre-encrypted password as it appears in the shadow file. Yeah. So, uh, you know, basically from this this dollar sign dollar six through the uh, the next colon here the slash here uh, if you put this in the precede file it will just yeah. pass this this password verbatim through to the shadow file here yeah. so you know we we have a couple of options here if we think down the road in terms of okay what is a user going to do to run this automation to install their own Z Linux. Um, you know, the, the, the script they run to do that could prompt them for what they want their password to be. Yes. And then, uh, and then oh, embed good. that in the pre-seed file, in which yep. case we would either embed it as plain text, <laughs> um, or it's actually surprisingly difficult to generate these. Yes. Uh, from a shell prompt like there's a utility in i think the who is package of all things yeah. <laughs> that might let you do it um but that that'll be something we can look into and and again that gets more not necessarily to what we need to figure out today to make pre-seed work but the shell script that wraps this all up uh what, what will be the best way for us to let the user pick a password uh, the alternative of course is for us to just embed a set password that's in the readme and then the first thing they should do once they log into their new system is change their password but i, I think it'd be more ideal if we can let them set a password from the start yes uh, there is some issues obviously because the generated encrypted password may contain some sequences that uh, bash or i don't know which uh interpreter we're going to use may have an issue with um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm speaking of experience. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to start copying these lines that seem relevant here. So let me see if I can do this. Um, let's make a new, whoops, control B, C. I'll call the CTC precede notes. Yep. Okay, uh, this one is definitely critical. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so used to screen still, I always hit control A and then the number. <laughs> and okay, yeah, so I, this was the very first question, right? Select the network type and the mode. So yeah, it appears this Linux mode uh, was working for us. So yes. second option there. That's good. And I'm guessing this isn't a value we actually precede, but let me just grab it so that we 
yep. have it. And there's our read device. Very good. Okay. I think that was it. Yep. Uh, did I did I grab that one just in case? No. Again, I'm guessing. I'm guessing this is not one we need to precede, but just in case, let's grab it. Yeah. Uh, do you think there's anything else that might be mainframe specific that we'd look for? Well, yeah, there's something here, which is uh, this is a CKD um, disk install. Right. And, um, I, you know, if we go with FBA, I don't know if those are exactly the same um, don't remember uh, off the top of my head but but uh, this uh, is certainly a CKD install yeah so what I'm hoping and I think from the precedes I've done before um, uh, there's a mode for the disks where you essentially just tell it whatever the first disk you find just use the whole disk and partition it the way you want automatically yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that isn't tied to a particular device address or device type. Um, I yeah. hopefully it'll just do the right thing and magically work. Uh, we'll leave that running in case we need to reference anything. But maybe now we can take a look at one of these samples. So let's uh, look at Ubuntu. Let's copy server to, we'll just keep working with try one here. Yep. And inside our installed image, I don't know that we really want to use LVM. I think we can just use regular you Linux. Know, I think in a second step, I think people will want to have LVM just so if you want to, um, it makes it much easier to expand the the dasty or add the second one and make it all look like one logical uh, volume. Maybe I just I wonder about the overhead and the emulated environment. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I, you know, yeah. I think one one approach is, uh, you know, maybe just if people do want to expand the space, uh, we can have easy instructions to attach a second device and then set it up as your home directory or something like that. Yeah. Um, but if they want to install more packages and expand the root device. Oh, well, uh, oh, so actually, because um, we're not distributing the finished DASD, right? That can just be a parameter to the script to set it up Yes. of how big they want that DASD init step to run. And then people can yeah. choose whatever size they want, and it just creates right it locally. Yeah, we, we don't really need to worry about distribution size like with the, the pre-made TK Ubuntu. So, OK, that's good. I'm not too worried about that then. Uh, so off to the side, I'm looking at a preset I've done before. It does ask for a device address, like dev SDA. I have hard coded into my preset file. Okay. So we yep. may need to know where the devices are. And for SCSI, is it SDA? Um, do you remember? Yeah, so that's what I don't know. I don't know if it'll be DASDA still or if FBAs will show up as a different device type. Yeah, we can actually find out. We can test that pretty quickly if we just shut, or actually, we can just attach maybe live and it may show up. Yeah, if we do an LS, uh, yep. Yeah, so let me. So the current one's at 120. If we say, what is it, attach, we'll put it at 121. Okay, so 121 and then 9336. And we have our, I'll just attach our try one. Since it's there. Image here. Since it's there, yeah. So I wonder if Linux picks that up dynamically. Let's look at. Uh, so there is yeah. some mainframe specific commands, which um, uh, let me, my control. So okay. let me see. Uh, see. Uh, where what's the command again? I always forget those because you don't really. <laughs> I would say probably not a command we've ever seen on uh, yeah. any other platform for sure. Um, if nothing else, we can just reboot it and hopefully it would pick it up at, at boot. It's this command here: chz dev 
and uh, there's also ch uh, I don't I don't really remember that. Um, Lee LS LS yeah there's LS. Or is that uh, LS DASD? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm typing over you here. Your controls. Yeah, it's just the one it knows about. So I am going to uh, just reboot here. <laughs> yep. Uh, that will probably be faster than me trying yep. to figure out how those commands work. <laughs> one of my controls. So one okay. of the things. Um, is that people sometimes wonder why is 121 at the bottom, not below this 120, because this will be the next device address. And one thing to remember is in this panel, which obviously emulates an S370 uh, real hardware panel, uh, it lists the devices in the order it finds it in the Hercules configuration file. It doesn't sort them by device address. What was very important to understand. So sometimes people have a lot of devices here, and there's one device they want to see, and then want to see 40 or 50, 32, 70 terminals in their Hercules panel here, then just put them at the top of your Hercules configuration file. Uh, yeah, I always put my you know massive list of terminals down at the bottom, so, so they're not getting in the way of other more interesting <laughs> devices on this panel. Yeah. So okay. uh, let's see where we are. Uh, starting reboot. So does it actually reboot? Yeah, it's, it's doing work. Okay. Well. Yeah, uh, I doubt it will actually. As it may reboot. not actually yeah. reboot. Yeah. Um, I don't think that Hercules is. It works on the real uh, iron, the real mainframe. Yeah. Yeah. It had. They had to add some capabilities to make the mainframe reboot uh, Linux, but it doesn't uh, work with Hercules. So we will have to just start it again. Uh, in fact, I'm just going to completely start Hercules again. Even interestingly, also, ZOS itself and MVS doesn't have a reboot uh, feature, uh, whereas ZVM does have uh, a reboot feature. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, do you want to go ahead and enter the oh, sorry, host yeah. uh, studio password, please? Thank you. OK, now, I don't want to forget to attach that. FBA device again. So, oh, oh, right. I don't know. Stop. <laughs> yeah, we have to put in the configuration file. Stop yes. all. Uh, so that was a 9336 at 1HD0.FBA. And so, again, for we're doing this to find out if the uh, SCSI devices or FBA devices are enumbed the same way in the operating system. So, Right, because, yeah, in our pre-seed, we need to know what device uh, name under Linux we want to format and install on. So it'll either be DASD0 or something else 0 for yeah. FBA devices. <laughs> and, of course... Uh, for folks who are watching this video, if they were expecting a fast, uh, <laughs> you know, answer to the question, how do I automate it? Uh, there is no fast answer that we, it's quite a tedious process to find out all these edge cases so that we can have a, as, as deterministic a, as possible, a process to have, uh, Ubuntu installed. Right. And like I said, we go through this so the viewers don't have to, right? We want to be able to say the answer to, well, how do I automate it is you look at the end result of our work here to figure this all out. Um, but yeah. obviously a lot of people are interested in, well, you know, how do you know that? How do you go about finding it out? And right, this is what we do. It's just kind of through experimentation and uh, see what things look like. And it's it's an iterative process to get there. We're not just born with this knowledge <laughs> for sure. Yep. And by the way, I don't know if you uh, know that, um, but the kind of sentence I'm doing, I'm going through this so that you don't have to, is was a standard sentence by Jerry Purnell at Byte magazine. Uh, he used to write this in his articles all the time and sadly passed away about five years ago. He was a friend of mine. Uh, Jerry Purnell was hugely popular during the 80s and 90s when Byte magazine was at its Peak. Really, at his peak, yeah. There was definitely a culture of, you know, people who were into computers um, 
we're much more into computers, <laughs> right? You had a computer because computers were kind of your hobby. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, now they're, of course, you know, everybody has computers um, uh, and they're much more accessible and, you know, they're, they're just tools for a lot of people and, and not just the hobby. But yeah, I, I think back to sort of the peak of Byte Magazine when, you know, uh, so many people were into just the internals and how everything worked. And uh, oh, yeah. it was it was much more of a, an exclusive club uh that uh that you were sort of either in or not <laughs> yeah there's the, the the first rule of our first law of computing by jerry Purnell at byte magazine was when something doesn't work always check the cables first and <laughs> yes. I, I stick to it to this day and it's it's just true I mean, <laughs> it's not yeah just reseat that cable maybe it came loose a little yeah okay moment of truth here nope. i doesn't see it at all uh, doesn't see it at all. Um, That's... There is really that. Um, there is a s sequence of of uh, things to do to make it see it. Uh, yeah, it may not just be auto detect all the new hardware. Um, yeah. I wonder. Yeah, that device doesn't show up at all. No. I was gonna say. I mean, our other option is to go back and boot the installer again and then just get back to the point where we can look in the shell there and see what it sees the device as i'm looking at um the chz command uh on a website here ah okay yeah that change device the link. dev yeah ah there's yeah. enable a device yeah first there is a way to first scan for devices okay list types to display supported device types hey i i'm actually now on an ubuntu page and it says to do so it's ch my controls so okay yeah so it's mm. oh uh sudo oh yeah configured yeah. So okay. So they will just still show up as DASD. Yeah, DASD. Okay. Perfect. Um, so it'll be DASD A when it's the only device. And uh, so now, if we look at Dev, we have yep. And also, we should be able to see it from uh, uh, more clock and. Uh, it's interesting up here on the change zdev command you told it dasd in the address and it already knew you can see it's dasd dash fba under the sys tree so um, yeah um, it is able to probe that and and know what type it is there they are okay yeah so we see one is a ckd type and then one's an fba type and they both and the, in. yeah this is what i was looking for the blocks so it is the correct it did recognize it. So as you can see in the Linux on the mainframe, of course, it needs to deal to the fact that the mainframe is a completely different architecture. And so that's why we need commands like um, the one we saw here. Oops, this one. Um, this is all mainframe, it doesn't exist on the Intel architecture uh, at all. But uh, this is the bus. Um, so in Linux on the mainframe has a notion of bus device, kind of like also deck computers used to uh, have and also uh for instance i believe the pa risk um computers as well and and sun they have a, a notion of a bus device and that's what we're uh, providing it with here oh, yes yeah, so that's what all these zeros are is in our emulated environment right it's just everything is on the same uh the same bus here yeah and the bus would be a channel in on the underlying Hercules, but Linux sees it as a channel ah, because obviously gotcha, yeah. we can we could um, in here. By the way, in Hercules a configuration file, you could you can specify a channel address. Some a little um, feature that is largely unknown, but you could specify in the Hercules configuration file a different channel for each device if we wanted to, which it can speed up things quite a bit because then each channel has its own thread so there is there is a way to make things faster as long as the underlying as as long as the guest operating system knows about it i understand Sorry. what it's doing there yeah yeah cool um because again right in the mainframe world 
there isn't really such a thing as attaching the end device directly to the mainframe, right? It's always going through channel controllers, right? 3390 DASD goes through a, what is it? 3890 controller. That's the wrong number, but it's, it's a, uh, 3990, yeah. 3990. And so, uh, that's part of what mediates between the actual final devices on kind of that star topology, uh, then back to the central processing complex of the mainframe. Yep. All right. So I think let's go over, uh, again to our, um, is it in here? No, I think it was in here. Yeah. So back to our pre-seed template. Um, I think we can do Hartman auto. Uh, why is that read only? Let's make that writable. Oh, because it yeah it was copied off a of CD, so I'm suspecting all of those are probably read only. Yep. Uh, so there's a DI Hartman auto disk. And that's where we'll tell it that we're doing dev DASD A. And then we can tell it DI partman auto method is regular. Yeah, no LVM. Yeah. No LVM. And uh, it looks like we can tell it to, let's see, we're starting with a new disk image. So I'm not sure these will be relevant, but this will say if there are existing um oh yeah partitions or anything right it will just automatically overwrite those or remove those so yeah. we can do that for lvm um, md which is the linux raid and yeah. we will also tell it to automatically confirm any changes to our Partition table. Again, these are all under this LVM tag, so I don't know if these will actually apply when we're using the regular method, but I've had these in my template forever and it never asked me anything about disks. So Yeah, since these are flags, if <laughs> that's if all it's good. Only, yeah. won't take yeah. again. So so what happens now with the LVM by default lines just below us now? Yeah, so I think we'll probably get rid of those. Um, yeah. So the other option is, uh, if you remember having gone through Ubuntu and Debian installers, it asks you if you want, you know, the simple everything in one partition, or if you want separate home partitions, separate var partitions, um, the all in one, uh, partitioning scheme, which I think will just be fine for our use is called the atomic partitioning scheme. Oh, okay. Yep. Did not know that. Um, and so that will automatically select that option uh, that you normally get during the installer to say, do you want it all in one? Mm -hmm. uh, so then, yeah, suggest LVM by default. I think we just get rid of yep. those. And so the uh, network configuration at the beginning, we... Ah, uh, yeah. So that stuff we do, we should, yeah, we should copy over all the relevant network config. Yeah, I don't think order matters here, but logically it makes sense that that would be at the, yeah. the top. So let's go, uh, I can be fancy about this and do it all from within Vim. What would be quicker? I'll just switch between the, the windows here and copy and paste. In fact, let me just copy all of this in and I'll delete anything if we don't want it. So the funny thing about the formats we're using for this uh, video is that uh, people who, the, the very same content that we're doing right now, people who view it on your channel will see a completely different uh, uh, terminal and a different view of all this, probably even different colors than the people who are watching the exact same video on my channel. So I think it's going to be fun to see what comes out at the end. Yeah, it's interesting. We're recording this separately on both sides, so... Yeah. Uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see if people like that. Okay. So yeah, this is all. Um, these are good questions. We want to keep that. Yep. Uh, this I'm. I'm gonna leave that commented out. I don't 
think that's no we didn't have that question relevant i'm gonna move this up in the order it appeared in the installer just again to keep this somewhat logically organized um, luckily both of us are vim uh, people <laughs> yeah it would be hard if one was Emacs, the other one. <laughs> We'd be along. fighting over whoever starts up the editor in our shared session wins. Yeah. <laughs> um, again, I don't remember this confirmation question, but I'll leave that in there. It can't hurt. Okay, yeah. protocol. Leave that in there. Is that the same? Okay, that's the same question. Uh, so we also What's missing needed... is the password for the SSH connection. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's see if that was back in here. I wonder what that would be called. So this is the actual user password setup. Network console. I wonder if it's going to be a network console password. Empty password. That's it for password. There's nothing about TK Ubuntu. Yeah, I don't think it's there. Um... Yeah. So how would we find? I'm going. Let's switch over to. Uh, on my side, I'm switching over to a web browser to <laughs> Google. Uh, Precede remote install password. Let's see if we get lucky here. Uh, Debian installer remote, network console password, and network console password again. So we can do it as a plain text. Okay. Um, Which is fine for our So purpose. yeah, we'll do that for now. Well, and again, this isn't used after the initial exactly. setup. And in fact, right, the user won't ever connect to this at all, I think, because the install will just happen automatically. But yes. it may be it may um, need, it to need it to continue the automation. So yeah. we'll we'll put this in here. Um, let's see. This was this is the wrong one, I think. Yep. <laughs> let's see. In fact, am I in what terminal? Am I? Yeah, here we go. So yeah, put that up here. There we go. So password. I'm guessing that's the type, and this is the... We'll just do that. That's the key value. Yep, I think you're right. Yep. Okay, so there's all the disk stuff. I uh, guess we should look at what else they give us. So force task server. So this, I assume, is setting up the server package Persona. selections. Yep. Yep. Uh, language support false. Only ask the UTC question if there are other operating systems installed. Uh, which they wouldn't be so UTC auto true. Um, don't do the splash screen. Don't be quiet. That's good. Front end. That's fine. Two seconds for grub. Well, we don't have grub on the mainframe, but uh, that's okay. Add the network and install OEM config. I wonder if this is steps that it's going to ask us to complete manually, which isn't quite what we want. But we'll take a look yeah. at that. Um, but the problem is we won't know if you're not logged in. So I don't know how this works. How yeah, I, and I, I wonder if we log in over that SSH connection, if we'll then see the automated stuff happening mm -hmm. uh, as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to look. We're, we're walking on uncharted territory here. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, Okay, so we turned off Splash. That's good. Uh, the other, some of the other things I have in my file are um, Debian installer locale, so it doesn't ask us for that. Oh yeah. yeah. And the keyboard is keyboard configuration XKB. Key map, select US. Yeah. And there's a, uh, you know, the other thing we haven't done is give it the IP address. Yep. 
So and let's look. The gateway. Back. Yeah, IP address and gateway. And and DNS. And DNS, sure enough. Uh, I wonder if those are all just going to be sort of the standard. Um, so that would be 10.1.1.1. Okay, yeah, so this is a standard net config. So there's our IP for gateway. I guess and, we'll have to search for dots too. Yeah, we'll need to look for all the other addresses. Okay, so at that point, I think that covers all of the questions it asked us initially. Yep. Yeah, because there's the password stuff. Okay. Um, so let me just, I'm scrolling through my, <laughs> I have a comment here in one of my files called um, disable, and this actually comes from the online Debian example, I think. Disable that annoying web key dialog. Now there's no, obviously no. no wireless network device installed, but yeah. uh, since it says disable it, we'll, we'll do that. <laughs> And we'll also allow it to install non-free hardware, just in case. Yeah, true. And uh, mirror, it asked us for the mirror drain install, so we'll need to automate that. So that's mirror country string manual. And then mirror HTTP host name. This was us.ports.ubuntu.com. Uh, yes. Slash. And there's a slash the Ubuntu. Yeah. Slash Ubuntu. Yeah. Okay. I think it was it was a combined name Ubuntu ports or something like that. Uh, let's, let's see, that should still be in the other one. Let's take a look. Yes. Um, HTTP directory. Yes, yeah, you're yeah, right. Ubuntu right. dash ports with a slash on the end. Yeah. And the encrypted volumes also, we have to, uh, say false. Uh, it's on the other precede. I, I think that's a default. That oh, okay. come from the partitioning scheme. So do we want to set up, uh, I guess the way this normally works is root login is disabled and then we set up a separate user. So uh, the way that works is password root login boolean false. Uh, and yeah. then we have the question of the user, which is uh, password user Full name, and we can call this. I don't know, what do we want the username to be? <laughs> Z Linux. Z Linux user. So it's clear to people yeah. where they're yeah. logging in. Yeah. Username. Uh, do we just want that to be Z Linux? Yep. Uh, so here's the password thing. So for now, let's try it with. I, th I think we do. Do you want to just do the word password for now? Uh, oh, just Zilinux. Oh, okay. Uh, and then I password, yeah, password think Zilinux. Zilinux. Uh, I think it's that. Let me switch over to the web browser here and say Debian pre -C password dash again. And we'll take a look at what it says. Of course, I get a hit on a page that doesn't have the term I searched for. Uh, yeah, password, password again. Uh, we'll give this a try, let's see what happens. And I think we're able to give our, I think it's user setup encrypt home boolean. False. Yeah, we don't want to add that overhead. <laughs> uh, I think we need to give it a time zone. Probably yeah. just default to UTC for everyone. Yeah, and then they can change it. I think that'll be a valid time zone. We'll see. I usually set my all my servers to UTC. 
Yeah, for servers that can that can be nice. Uh, where do we tell the keyboard? I think there's another d dash i console setup ask detect false. Oh yeah, yeah. We just want it to yep. use the one that we told it. Yeah. Um, there's another. What net config lines do we have? Net config, net config, net config. There's a net config choose interface auto. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's for the net plan. Yeah. Right, because again, I think, right, these initial questions, yeah. uh, I think things like the IP address will carry through. But yeah, once it's in the installer, it may want to reset up the network. Yeah, this ends up in the net plan 01 yeah. configuration yeah. file. Yeah. I think there's another, we'll throw this in, net config disable auto config so it doesn't use DHCP. DHCP so it uses the addresses that we yep. gave it. I wonder if these I wonder Need if these are be... actually supposed to be git underscore or if the actual value we use is supposed to be without it. Um, it seems weird. I'm going to try. Well, Let's it just can't them with exactly. Them. Can't both. hurt to have both. Yeah. There we go. Because each time we, we try any of these changes, uh, it takes probably five to 10 minutes until we, we, we get into the problem, right? Exactly. Everything we miss, uh, Will require us to yeah wait for it to to redo some stuff. Okay, so we have let's see we have force tasks server. Uh, the other thing I have in one of my files uh, to your point about SSH is task cell. I have something called first where we select. Actually, it's a multi-select. We select server and open SSH server. Yep. Uh, now, if if it wouldn't install SSH, we could still get in from the console, just log in from the console, which you can do, and then do an apt update and an apt uh, uh, install SSH. Yep. In fact, I have a, a GitHub GIST. If people know those GIST, is like a a place on GitHub to store uh, in incantations and invocations. And I have there a bunch of uh, uh, SED lines, SED, uh, which um, temporarily remove um, uh, uh, a public private key login only to SSH so that people can fix things and do a normal SSH. Uh, if they end up like getting yeah, locked out or. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think we're probably close. Um, yeah, I don't see anything missing. I guess we have to try at this point. Yeah, I think we can try and see if it prompts us for anything. Or then resort to uh, uh, Hercules console automation. Uh, yeah, if, if those initial questions... Uh, Get us hung up. We can try that. Like it knows about that, so yeah. Um, I think. Let me look back at the documentation here. Auto mode. I oh, know auto mode is something else. Um, creating a pre-config file. The file should start with pound underscore precede. So let's paste this into the beginning. And we'll see what else we need. The grub at the end of this file, we probably don't need. I mean, since there is no grub. Yeah, the grub stuff. Um, but it's a flag, so it's OK. Yep. For those of you that were kind of wondering where some of the lines I was typing came from, uh, they're here in the 
like I said, kind of appendix B of the yeah. Debian manual has oh, a lot nice. of information on preceding. Yeah. yeah, network console. Use the following okay. settings if you wish to make use of the network console component for remote installation. Right. So it shouldn't be necessary for fully automated installations. But yeah, that, that network console password is uh, is what sets that up. So that's good. Account setup. Uh, clock and time zone, we set UTC. I think we can set, uh, where did we set UTC? I think we just want clock setup UTC true. That way it won't ask, even if it thinks there are other operating systems, it will just always force it to true. Okay. So the next question is, how do we get this pre-seed file into our installation? And if it were available on a file system available to the installer, we could just pass in a file parameter to the boot um, params in that param file. But I don't think all of the files in this uh, directory installed, right? I think only the files that are in this .ins file we looked at earlier get loaded yes. into memory. And like yeah. this install CD doesn't just show up as a mounted device to Linux. No. So what that means is we need to put the pre-seed file in the init RD. And there's a way to build that, right? Right. And so I know how to build it for x86, but I don't know what these extra files are. In fact, they're empty. So what it really boots so it may from not is matter. the INS file, right? Yeah, so this Ubuntu INS, that's interesting. It loads these empty files at certain addresses. Uh, so I wonder if we just change the initRD if we don't need to worry about any of these, or is this some magic? How big is that init RD? Um, boot init RD dot Ubuntu. Oh, can yeah. we? We want the real. Yeah, sorry, I use it. That's okay. That. Yeah. So, does anyone know what that number in hex is? Let me get out my hex calculator. I wonder if this matches that, um, that that address. That address, right? If it's sort of using the address to pass the size, so one three three seven four zero eight one. Now that in hex is C C one two eight one, so that's no entirely related. Yeah. Uh, so I guess the other question is. Is this a regular gzipped, or this might not be compressed? It is compressed. Okay, because yeah, it says um, uncompressing. Yeah, gzip compressed data. Okay. Uh, so let me look at. So the, basically, you have to provide a g unzip in the kernel to unzip the image as it boots. Right. Yeah, so the Linux kernel has the the gzip code to uncompress its initial yeah. RAM disk. Uh, so let's make sure this directory is writable. Uh, so let me make a temp directory here and copy init. Well, you have to have oh, the beginning thank of you. The yep. <laughs> init rd.ubuntu to init rd.gz. And then G unzip that. Okay, that worked. Um, so this, I believe, is a CPIO image. Exactly. Yeah. So we can uh, extract that. Really? It should be able to open it for reading. Why would it try to write to it? It is. It has read. Oh, I see what I'm doing. Oh, so I can do. Um, this is actually trying to add the precede file to it. So let me. 
uh, we'll make that writable. And then we actually say CPIO dash O. Right. So this is adding a new yes. no. um, file to it. And we want to add it to our init RD. And the file we add is our precede. Precede. So uh, the, it's going to take a file name. Uh, and the minus A in this case, the dash A, what does it do? Uh, that's a good question. I think I just pulled this from the Debian oh, okay. install guide at some point. <laughs> I haven't done CPIO in like in Me years. neither. Yeah. yeah. What did we call our pre-seed file? Was it this guy? Yeah. OK, let's make sure that's the right one. Yes. OK, so the command here is uh, we're actually going to give the file name we want to add to this CPIO yep. command. So that will add the file called precede.cfg to the existing yes. CPIO archive. OK, it claims it added eight blocks. So now we can gzip that initrd back. OK, let's move the original initrd.ubuntu out of the way. .ubuntu original, and then move our new uh, initrd to initrd.ubuntu. So oh, minus uh, dash a is append. Oh, append. OK, perfect. So it's appending that file into the existing yeah. CPIO archive. Thanks for looking that up. Um, do you know what the dash h new c does? Is that just like a uh, newer version of CPIO format? Which one? Dash? Dash h new yeah. c. Uh, I had I it we can look here. Dash uh, h uh, format. Yeah. So yeah, sure. yeah, it's the format. Uh, new SVR4 portable format. Supports file systems having more than uh, 65,536 inodes. Perfect. <laughs> it's very new. <laughs> Funny definition of new there. <laughs> so I th think that's all we need to do. We have our new init RD with our precede file in it. Uh, let's shut this system down. Did I get caps lock on somehow? No. Uh, OK, so this is TK Ubuntu. So yeah, let's yeah. shut down. Dash you need to sudo to shut down. Yeah. Ah, yes, thank you. TK Ubuntu. And the good thing is it goes down really quick, um, much, much faster than it takes. To, like, <laughs> So uh, okay, yeah, really connection problem. closed, and yeah. we'll just wait a minute here. Start it's already done. Oh, the instruction counter is still going. Oh, but this yeah, is just that. Because, yeah, it's like yeah. when we tried to reboot it. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Okay. And uh, one nice thing is that there is actually a well defined API on the mainframe um, when uh, somebody enters a shutdown command on the real console it's supposed to uh, gracefully shut down the guest operating system. And it works for ZVM and for Linux, but not for ZOS, because obviously the shutdown procedure for ZOS is extremely complicated. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, 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 there's so usually you, a manual run book that the operations people would use and everything to Right. But so in that. Hercules, you can just write quit um, on the Hercules console, and it will gracefully shut down Linux. That's nice, yeah. OK, so I just made a nice, fresh, empty image in case our previous uh, yep. attempts did anything. Uh, I think this Hercules conf is already correct. Yes. OK, looks yep. good. The ton tunnel interface is still set up as far as I can. Yep, IP tables should all still be set up. Um, this Ubuntu server seed was the example. Let me just get rid of that so we don't confuse ourselves. Yes. And the real one is in our modified uh, sort of CD directory now. So 
I am curious what's going to happen here. <laughs> a moment of truth yeah. for, uh, for try one. Uh, so we should just be able to IPL from that Ubuntu directory, the ubuntu.ins. And this step, of course, we can easily automate. Right. Yep. Yeah, this is just in the Hercules RC file to start yep. it up the first time. Absolutely. All right. So the first question is, will it be happy with that modified init RD? Mm -hmm. we'll or is find there something? In the next 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Uh... I re I'm really curious now. Or is there something magical about that, you know, dot size and dot offset file that we're missing? I tend to believe that yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Unpacking it enough. Okay, it's trying to unpack it. That's a good sign. Yes. Okay. Uh, disable weight. Disable state. weight state. Um, kernel panic. Uh, can I page up here? Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what it said. Right. It, it does make me think like it needs to know how much to extract. <laughs> um, yeah. Let's see. Interrupt code 10. Late instruction. Where did it say unpacking a knit RD? Uh, I may set the Hercules tailor mode to quiet so that we're not getting these Hercules messages as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so there's Linux. Uh, yeah, so Linux version, blah, 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 blah. Right, protect kernel. Kernel command line. Oh, we can let's we'll look at the parameters as well. Maybe that's where it tells it. But um, dev tempfs. Un okay, so unpacking okay. init Unpack. ramfs. Yeah, yeah. Random init ramfs unpacking failed read error. error yeah that's the problem yeah so that's certainly a problem uh, let's quit hercules here so there's another important file in here which is the param file and it's empty okay so there's no size information in that these are really oh they're not empty that's the size in hex yeah okay that makes sense yeah. so if we look at our init rd dot ubuntu now it's a different size than it was before yeah. so let me convert um to hex yep so one three five O nine five three nine in hex is now uh C E two three A three, which is a little bigger than the existing value, which makes sense. Um so let's do a init rd dot size dot new so that becomes an e and that becomes two three a three and then xxd has a reverse mode doesn't it yeah dash r so if i yeah. do uh xxd dash r dot size dot new if I send it back through XXD, we should see the new value. Yep. So that becomes our new initrd.size. Oh, no, just initrd.size. And of course, permission denied. And now we have to rebuild the, um, the initrd. Uh, no, this is outside the initrd, and it just tells it how big it is. 
This is referenced in the um, ubuntu.ins file. Okay. So offset. Ah, so then that's the address that we see in ubuntu.ins of where it's loading the init rd in memory. And that's fine. I mean. Yep. And that's the same as before. So that's uh, interesting. That so the kernel loads at zero. We talked about that in the IPL process. The offset, so the Linux kernel knows that it, at memory address hex 1040C, there will be a value that tells where the init RD is in memory. And the, the contents of that file says uh, it's at this address. And so that address, basically a pointer to, to this yeah. address gets yeah. loaded into this address in memory. And the kernel will look at this address for the Find pointer to the init RD. So, and similar for the size, the size, the contents of the file size, which we just modified, gets loaded into this address. And the kernel which is knows, shortly after a couple of bytes after the. Yeah, it's just kind of another file. parameter. Yeah. Um, so, this is why it couldn't extract our modified init RD because the size that was loaded into memory uh, was too short. It didn't have the new data at the end of our file. So, that's really interesting. Uh, let's let's try this again. And with that, I'm going to leave you all hanging. Will our new initRD with the correct size specified work? Will we boot into the Ubuntu installer? You'll have to check the next video, which will be out very soon. And uh, then again, if you wait for part three, we'll demonstrate our finished product. Um, so spoiler alert, I think we managed to get it to work. We'll have to check the future. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you again very soon.